so I'm talking to, about osteoporotic uh, hip and femur fractures and surgical management. Uh, it's not quite as emergent as the things that Dr. Nemechek was just talking about. Those guys are um, saving lives day and night. But this is something that probably is a little bit more pertinent to all of us in terms of the fact that if any of you in your practices has anybody over 50 years of age, you will have patients who ha encounter these types of problems uh, as they age. Uh, my disclosures, I am a paid consultant for Acumed, which has really no relevance to this. None of the implants that you see in any of these images are from Acumed. Uh, so let's just jump right in. We're talking about osteoporosis, right? Uh, when I started medical school, bone broke, must fix sounded really awesome. It seemed pretty straightforward. It, uh, it was much to my chagrin a little bit later that I learned it wasn't quite so straightforward. As patients age, they develop osteoporosis. Uh, and what that really means as far as us for fixing is if you look at the, these pictures here on the right and the left, you can see a very dramatic difference. Uh, we used to think of it primarily as a, as a disease of trabecular bone. That is to say, on the right side is normal. On the left side, you see increased distance between the, the, the spicules. The spicules are more rod-like, fewer of these uh, kind of plate-like structures in them. Uh, and they are not as strong. There's a lot more space between them. We've also found when we take microsections of the cortical bone, however, there's also some changes in the cortical bone with increased porosity, okay? For us, what that, what that considerations mean, if we're putting pieces of metal, screws or metal in here to hold, there's a lot more holding power in this thicker bone than there is in the other bone. So we have de decreased strength of the, uh, of the uh, bone and fracture toughness, which leads to these fragility fractures. So what's the burden of disease? I think Dr. Klein and you guys probably have a better grasp, grasp, grasp on this kind of stuff than, than we do as orthopedists, but just to give some basic numbers, about 11% of all Americans aged greater than 50 have osteoporosis. Uh, over 40 million uh, Americans have got low, been diagnosed with low bone mass, and over 10 million have got osteoporosis. Uh, in the United States, uh, osteoporosis is more prevalent for females in all age groups. And there's some data there you can see. I think the one that really scares me, oops, sorry, is this bottom number right here. Over a third of women over 80 have osteoporosis. And I see that certainly weekly, if not daily in my practice, a lot of older women with fragility fractures, okay? The projections, uh, again, from this National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey are that by 2030, we'll have nearly 60 million people with low bone mass and over 13 million people with osteoporosis, okay? You guys know the diagnosis of this uh, as much as I do. DEXA is sort of the gold standard, or at least it has been. Uh, when we get the, it, that is a uh, measure of bone density. It's uh, then uh, reflected in, t or the T-score is calculated against what is theori theoretically the maximum bone mass of the average person. Uh, low bone mass is more than one standard deviation, but less than two standard deviations below the average. And a, a osteoporosis diagnosis is when you are less than two and a half standard, de or de more than two and a half standard deviations from that average. Primary, primary osteoporosis is the most common etiology. Uh, that results from normal physiologic processes such, of, such as aging, aging and menopause. Uh, the list of secondary osteoporosis is uh, bewildering. I think the important thing first is to recognize, golly, is that up to a third of patients will have some other cause of their osteoporosis, and that's really important for us all to recognize. This list is very extensive. For an orthopedic surgeon, it's very intimidating. If the differential diagnosis is more than the number of bones in the thigh, we usually just call somebody. But here you can see lifestyle decisions such as smoking, alcohol intake, uh, exercise levels, diet, including calcium and vitamin D intake, uh, certainly endocrine issues like hyperthyroidism uh, or parathyroidism, systemic diseases, particularly our inflammatory uh, systemic diseases, rheumatic diseases, um, and then organ dysfunction, pulmonary and cystic fibrosis and the COPD, renal diseases, neoplastic diseases, uh, even medications can cause these type of problems. One of the most common secondary causes of, of osteoporosis is uh, chronic glucocorticoid use. So those are things just to look at uh, when someone has a diagnosis of osteoporosis because if there is something that we can identify and treat, that can really help prevent the development of fracture. So fragility fractures, what does that mean? That is uh, basically a fracture of any bone uh, that occurs in the clinical setting of osteoporosis. 
It's usually a, a low energy fracture, and that oftentimes it's a presenting symptom of osteoporosis. In other words, a patient does not have a diagnosis of osteoporosis until they've fallen and broken a bone. The most common sites in order are the vertebral body, the distal radius, the hip, and the proximal humerus. Um, we're talking about hip and the, uh, femur fractures today because those are the, uh, the ones that most commonly require surgery and also the ones that can really impact uh, quality of life and lifestyle and uh, recovery can be quite difficult sometimes. So what's the burden of disease of fragility fractures? Uh, according to some of these uh, surveys in the last 10 years or so, uh, 4.3 million clinical visits per year. That means follow-up visits, of course, as well as presenting visits. Uh, in 2011, uh, 1.7 million hospitalizations for females only greater than 55 years of age. 23% of those were hip fractures. 8.4% for vertebral fractures, so that's 375,000 hip fractures in females alone older than 55 years, and that was in 2011. The average length of stay, according to some of these data, uh, for a fragility fracture hospitalizations is five and a half days, uh, which did, had not, did not differ at that time when controlled for age or fracture site. Uh, and the vast majority of those patients ended up having to get a um, or, uh, transferred to a skilled nursing facility from their hospitalization. So it's a big deal in terms of cost as well as uh, interruptions in these patients' lives and their families' lives. More specifically, hip fractures. There's an increasing incidence per year uh, due to our aging population. We've all been aware of that coming for a long time. Uh, to the, according to the CDC, there are 250,000 hospitalizations for hip fractures in patients older than 65 years. The vast majority of these are from just ground level falls, which we see over and over and over again. Uh, interestingly, for Caucasians, the annualized incidence of uh, hip fracture has been decreasing by about 1 to 1.5 percent per year, uh, but uh, overall incidence increasing due to the uh, larger population. Uh, these fractures are a big deal. Uh, if you uh, are over 65 and have a hip fracture, You've got a 98% chance of getting rehospitalized for some, something within the next six months, compared to only a 27% chance if you did not have a hip fracture. So it's an indication of maybe something more global going on than just breaking a bone. Uh, Long-term outcomes, these have significant increases in mortality, debility, cost, uh, and changes in lifestyle. Uh, when I was in training back in the 90s, it was just kind of a, a rule of thumb that one out of every two patients with a hip fracture will be dead within, 10, within 12 months. Uh, those numbers have gotten better now, but still 20 to 30 percent mortality within 12 months. Uh, at least 50 percent of your patients who have a hip fracture will not get back to their prior level of activity or their level of independence. That's a big, big deal for the patients and the families uh, because Everybody remembers what Granny used to be like and are very frustrated after her hip fracture why she's not back why, the way she was that they remember. Uh, so what do we want to do here for hip fractures, our goals of care? We want to get ra rapid medical optimization. Uh, we have got these medical co-management models or fracture liaison, uh, fracture liaison service models. This is kind of co-management of patients in the hospital. I don't like the term medical stabilization because a lot of these patients are stable. Uh, and uh, you know, medical clearance, I'm not sure exactly what that means. To me, we want them to be in the best shape they can be as rapid as we can for surgery. Uh, a lot of these patients have got a zillion medical problems that will never eliminate their risks of surgery, and we just want them to be as best as we can. All of the data in the orthopedic literature suggests that the outcomes are much better if you can get the OR within 36 hours. So we really push these days to fix these faster. In the old days when I was a resident, patients sat around for three, five, six days before we got to the OR for a number of different tests or waiting until uh, the wind blew the right direction or whatever, and that's really not appropriate. The, not, the outcomes are much, much worse if they have to wait longer. We want to get stable fixation that allows early mobilization and weight bearing. I think that's key. We used to put, them, uh, put fixation in that wasn't that great. They couldn't get up and move very well. They laid in bed forever. They got bed sores, delirium, and all the other urinary tract infections, all the problems we see with just chronic lack of mobilization. So we want them to be able to get up and get moving and get back to their lives as best as possible. We want to do minimally invasive surgical techniques when possible. Smaller incisions, less bleeding, less risk. 
Uh, when we get them up and going afterwards, minimal use of narcotics and sedatives. We all know the problems with that. And again, delirium that's induced by their hospitalizations. Uh, aggressive mobilization with physical therapy. We get the social services and case management involved in working with the patient and the families to arrange for appropriate uh, discharge plan. Uh, we want to treat osteoporosis and its underlying causes if possible. But I think maybe this bottom thing is the, one of the most important things, at least when dealing with the family, is that we need to understand that the fall and the fracture that happens is not the cause of the patients slowly debilitating. It's a symptom. Many of these patients have had two or three falls before they break their hip. The fracture and the surgery they had did not suddenly cause Granny to stop having her memory as well or not be able to navigate as well. And it's important to let these, pa these patients and family know that this has been, something has been going on with them long before they fell and broke their hip. So what is a hip fracture? That sounds kind of stupid, but th there's a lot of terms that are thrown on when we talk about hip fractures. So to an orthopedist, what it really means very specifically is a fracture that just involves the hip joint. That would be just this area here, the hip socket, the acetabulum, the femoral head, and the neck, which is still all within the capsule of the joint. But you will also see a lot of other terms kind of loosely applied to hip fractures. So something kind of in this rough area, in this rough area here, okay? Uh, a fragility fracture of the pelvic ring, which is this whole set of bones, right? The acetabulum, which of course is the hip socket, the femoral head, the femoral neck, and then the top end of the thigh bone, even what we call the intertrochanteric region right here, and even kind of high up but just below the uh, lesser trochanter in this area, are all things that you could consider hip fractures. So when your patients or your family says, I got a hip fracture, or when the ER doc calls us and says we got a hip fracture, that could mean a whole lot of things, and they're not all the same. So that's a big difference for us when we're thinking about this is hip fracture is just kind of, to me, a very generic term that says oh, there's a fracture somewhere there, okay? So uh, the vast majority of fragility uh, fractures of the pelvis uh, and hip fractures in general are from a ground level fall to the side. You get an impact on the, uh, kind of landing on the side here. Um, when we're looking at the pelvis, a single view AP uh, pelvis is not enough, and I'll show you some x-rays that show that. So for, for my purposes, we get three views, which are an AP, an inlet, and an outlet view, which I'll also show you in a minute, or a CT scan. Um, the vast majority of these pelvic ring injuries are minimally displaced. Okay, again, a patient falls on their side, they land here, let's say, and what happens is this ring wants to crush this way, and what you get is sort of a rotation of this pelvis. It hinges on the back, kind of where the sacrum is, so you get sort of a compression here, and the front structures fracture and allow this hemipelvis to rotate in. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll show you some x-rays and CT scans. Uh, but with a minimal displacement, these are stable. We allow patients to start weight-bearing immediately. We used to not uh, do that, and that we took a long time getting them going, and what we found is not only that, did that give us all the problems with immobilization and bed rest, but it wasn't necessary. And patients really, at this age, have a very difficult time abiding by weight-bearing restrictions anyway. So a couple of really smart guys did some studies probably 10 years ago now. Uh, and de demonstrated that you can let these patients just put as much weight on it as they want, and they're very unlikely to displace, and they can mobilize and get back to life a lot faster. So, okay, if most of them don't need surgery, which ones do? And those would be the unstable ones. Those are ones that have a high amount of comminution, multiple fracture lines and pieces, ones that are highly displaced, or fractures that are very painful or displaced when the patients do start walking on them. Those are the ones that need a reduction in stabilization from our standpoint. So I'm gonna run through just a whole number of fractures, okay? Some of them you will see in your practices first, some of them I will see first in the ER. So we'll start with a patient who has sacral stress fractures, okay? This is a 95-year-old female. Uh, she had had a, a ground level fall about a year ago, um, complained of bilateral back pain, pelvic pain and, uh, with, when she walked. Uh, X-rays that were taken by her primary care physician were negative. She was weight bearing as tired, she got better. Six months later, she fell again had the exact same symptoms, pain bilateral in her pelvis, in her lower back with ambulation and weight-bearing. X-rays were negative. This time, the primary care provider obtained a uh, MRI, and it showed sacral stress fractures. So what we're looking at here, these are axial views, the right side of the patient on the right side, or the, what is that, your left side of the screen, and here's the left side of the patient. Uh, and what we see are these kind of little lines going here inside the sacrum. This is the SI joint, right, between the ilium and the sacrum. So here on these other images, you can see again, 
these lines here that were not apparent on plain x-ray. So she has sacral stress fractures. These are non-operative in almost all cases. Patients can be weight-bearing as tolerated. We usually tell them to use an assistive device so they can use their arms to offload their painful fractures while they're healing. Treating the underlying osteoporosis, if it's not already being managed, is, of course, very important. Uh, a month later, this patient came back to see me. She's ambulatory. She's got decreased pain already with weight bearing. These are the three x-ray images I told you guys about earlier. So here's an AP view. Again, I get these to make sure it's not propagating, okay? And here, what I'm looking for is a negative finding. I don't see any fracture lines on the plain x-ray, which would be indication of the fracture getting worse. Again, these are the sacroiliac joints, not fractures. Uh, this is an inlet view, which is actually the best view for me to look at the sacrum. And again, the fractures, if they were propagating, would be right up there and there. And they look fine. This is an outlet view. And we see no evidence of fracture. That's good, OK? We continue weight bearing as tired with assistive device. Um, when do these need surgery? Almost never. But if someone is, goes on more than six months and still has pain with weight bearing, in very select cases, you might consider a surgery. Uh, surgical stabilization, which would be putting in a couple of big screws from either side to help give a little bit of, uh, of stability and support there. Um, there are reports of some guys starting to do this a little bit more aggressively, but I, uh, even though I'm a trauma surgeon, I'm sort of conservative in terms of my indications for elective surgery, and I don't do it unless you really need it. And if you can wait three or six months and you don't need a surgery, I think that's way better for patients, especially our elder patients. So, a lateral compression pelvic ring injury. Fell down and has a hip fracture of the pelvic ring, okay? This is a stable one, okay? 84-year-old guy, uh, he's got some dementia, history of a stroke, he's got some right-sided deficits. He had a ground-level fall and was complaining of pain and inability to bear weight afterwards. Uh, in the ER, they got plain x-rays and a CT scan, okay? And this shows a, a pelvic ring injury as well as a proximal femur fracture on the right side. Oops, sorry. Um, so here's the femur fracture, okay, pretty obvious. But what I think is interesting is this also shows half of the pelvis. And if you didn't know better, you would say oh, there's no fracture there, right? It's very subtle. This is why an AP pelvis is not useful for looking at pelvic ring injuries by itself. But if we look at the CT scan, we see here's a sacral fracture, okay? It's a compression fracture. What that means is you can see the contour is a little bit different over here. It's a tighter curve than that side. It's compressed in a little bit. There's also pubic rami fractures, a parasympathetic fracture. So there's fractures on the right side of the hemipelvis, all right? Now this guy's got a femur fracture also, so he's got to go to the OR to fix that. So we did, some, uh, one of my partners did a nice femoral rod here. It looks great, okay? And then we allow them to start weight bearing as tardy because the pelvic ring fractures look stable, okay? We give them DVT prophylaxis for about three weeks to prevent blood clots. Anytime we have a significant pelvic fracture or femur fracture that needs surgery, that's kind of a standard treatment at this point. Uh, Follow up, we come back at two weeks, two months, four months, six months, get x-rays. At six months, this guy's healed, both fractures. The femur looks good. We don't see any persistent fracture line here. The, four, the fractures in the anterior pelvis have healed. Uh, the AP inlet view and outlet view. The patient's having no pain and ambulatory. That's success, okay? I think the big thing is, again, with that strong rod in the femur and the pelvis that we didn't have to fix, weight bearing immediately, minimum time down for this patient the best chance to get back to their lives. All right, so here's another one that was a non-operative, unstable lateral compression pelvic ring injury. 81-year-old guy, cleaning gutters on his roof. These guys are, oh, this guy's awesome, actually. He, had, he was smart enough, he put a safety rope on, which is not always the case. The rope broke, and he fell down. Hauled himself into his house, crawling on the ground, called uh, uh, EMS and got brought in. He had a sh uh, shoulder pain and hip pain. Uh, X-ray showed a shoulder dislocation and pelvic ring fractures. Uh, again, here on this plain AP view, you can see a fracture here, okay? Uh, and maybe something going on here. CT was also ordered. And what we see here is uh, a couple of different uh, fractures. So we see a uh, fracture in the back here of the sacral ala again. There's also a fracture of the ilium in the back. Uh, the next views will show parasympathetic fractures and, uh, why am I keep doing this? Uh, so a rami fracture, a lot of times this is read as an acetabular fracture by radiology because it's so close to the socket. It's not an acetabular fracture, it's just a root of the pubic ramus fracture. Here's a pair of symphysial fracture and an inferior pubic rami fracture, okay? So the fall from the height's a little bit of a higher energy injury. This is to me what makes this what I consider an unstable fracture. There's more energy imparted, there's more fracture lines. 
a little bit more comminution. We're going to treat this a little bit differently. It's minimally, minimally displaced. That means I don't need to put it back where it belongs, so it doesn't need surgery, at least not right now. The pelvic symmetry is good. The continuity is maintained, so non-operative, but I don't want them to put weight on this and stress this because it could displace and then they buy a surgery that they don't need to get right now. So this is a patient that I would say toe touch weight bearing. We used to do non-weight bearing, but what we found is almost no patient older than 60 years of age can actually do non-weight bearing anyway, so we tell them to toe touch. It actually secondarily puts a little bit less stress on the fracture by being able to rest your foot on the ground instead of having to hold it up where the compressive forces of the hip muscles actually put a little bit of stress on those fractures. So we mobilize with physical therapy. I give her DVT prophylaxis. Uh, we come back in two weeks. The patient's having some mild discomfort with ambulation, but no displacement on the x-rays. I allow them to start putting 50% weight on that leg. What is 50%? I don't know, but what I think is probably different than that patient thinks. To me, what it means is they can put some weight on it, but not all of their weight. And if they comply with that, they're doing pretty well. At six weeks, minimal discomfort, still no displacement on the x-rays. We let her go, get back going to full weight bearing. Came back at three months, no pain, not using a cane, healing on the fractures, and continue weight bearing. So here is the three-month x-rays. Uh, again, our three standard views. And what we see is pelvic ring looks nearly perfectly symmetric again. The fractures we can hardly see. Again, here you can see just the evidence of the old fracture. It's a little bit tighter of a curve here than there. Uh, and maybe a little bit of callus there, but no interval displacement there. You can see that fracture line still persistent, but getting kind of fuzzy or faint. I tell my older patients that it looks almost like you took an eraser to it. They're the only ones who understand that, uh, but uh, it gets fuzzy and that's new bone that's filling in there. So it looks great, healing, minimally symptomatic. Again, we've avoided surgery. So how about one that needed surgery? So here, this is a, a little bit different story. It's a slightly younger patient, 57-year-old female, Restrained passenger in a, a car was in a T-bone MVA, hip on the side, okay? Same mechanism, getting hit on the side, but much higher energy. However, that being said, uh, in the ER, she's complaining of pain on her right side. Uh, this is, again, why an AP pelvis doesn't really tell the full story, okay? We see, well, if you look at that, it doesn't look so bad at all, right? Maybe something's going on here. Uh, we got a CT scan, and that shows um, sacral ala fracture. This is this typical pattern we see over and over again, sacral ala fracture. Parasympathial fracture, see some comminution here though now, right? It's not a very simple fracture pattern uh, and an inferior pubic ramus fracture there. Uh, higher energy, so uh, what are we gonna do? It seemed minimally displaced at the time. You could see that even on the AP pelvis view. So we're gonna say, let's try non-operative. Touch down weight bearing with assistive device, mobilize with physical therapy, DVT prophylaxis, and early follow-up to get new x-rays. So this patient comes back at two weeks, Mark. This was actually managed by one of my partners, at two weeks she's having terrible pains in her right hip, having a lot of time mobilizing. And now you can see very easily, even on the AP view, this has shifted, significant. It correlates with her pain on her side, okay? And he said, oh geez. So he sent the patient to me now and say, well, uh, you, you take care of it. So, uh, which, is no, which is what should happen, okay? Uh, so we said, okay, that's clearly moved. We need to take you to the OR. And I'm sorry these washed out a little bit. But we took her to the OR and we put a fixer on and this is to grab a hold of the pelvis and literally derotate that. So her pelvis rotated inwards, and I need to rotate it out. So I put on this fixer. This is an inlet view, or uh, yeah, this is the AP view, and it just shows the pelvic ring. Again, that fracture that you saw rotated in, we, don't, we see it lined up nicely again. Here's an inlet view, just showing the front again, lined up nicely again, and the outlet view showing everything looking good up front here, okay? Uh, here's some post-op imaging and follow-up imaging. Uh, like every good orthopedic surgeon, I cleverly put my metal right over the fracture so you can't see. But the pelvic symmetry is well maintained. Uh, on the inlet view, it looks very good. The fractures here is not rotated anymore, and the outlet view looks pretty normal. These, these are the fracture, or this fixer consists of two pins that go into the good solid bone above the hip joint in the pelvis, uh, and a frame that comes outside, which patients detest. There are some other ways to treat this, depending on what's available in the patient's body habitus. For someone who's got some more meat on their bones, that you can actually, there are some fixtures that will go under the skin, uh, and sometimes you can put some screws in instead of a fixator. It really depends on bone quality and a couple of other factors. Um, but this, pa this patient needed a fixator. We put that on. Uh, we followed up at two weeks, six weeks, three months. X-rays look good. She was begging me to take this off as soon as possible, which is not strange. Three months later, we take the fixator off. 
Uh, six months after injur injury, she's ambulatory. She's thrilled that she doesn't have a fixture anymore. She's thrilled she has no pain. And her x-rays show good realignment. The fracture is healed in good alignment on all three views here. Okay, looks great. That was success, and that was exactly what should have happened in that. We try not to operate, but if it forces us to, then we get in there and do the surgery. Okay, just for completeness sake in the pelvis. So here's one that's kind of obviously needs a surgery. Okay, this is a 57-year-old guy. Again, on the roof, 16 feet up, fell down, landed on his backside. He's hypotensive in the ER, okay? This is not something that you guys will have to deal with, hopefully. But he comes in, you can see this is a classic what we call open book fracture, right? The pelvis opens up like a book, rips open the pubic symphysis. There's a widening here of the SI joint. Uh, this is this binders that you guys hear, okay? It just wraps around the greater trochanters and you close it down. Actually, one of my residency mates did the, the first study on this kind of stuff, and it closes it down very nicely and actually helps hypotension. It's a life-saving maneuver in some cases. CT scan, uh, this is with the binder on, so you can see how that's closed down the front with the binder. But what we see is uh, SI joint dislocation on the, right, or the left side that's widening there. Uh, and on the right side, we see fractures of the sacrum and the ilium here, okay? This needs surgery, uh, no question about it. So we take them in the OR, uh, and this is actually not as in invasive uh, as you might think. This plate in the front, which closes down the front on, in the rami, and this is looking at an inlet view, just showing the uh, contour of the, of the uh, pelvic ring again. Uh, and that goes through a little fan and steel incision like you would get for an elective C-section, but smaller. And then we put a couple of big screws in in the back to close down the fractures and the dislocation in the back, and those go through incisions the size of your fingertip. So not a huge surgical dissection for a pretty significant injury. Uh, this is what it kind of looks like uh, in the follow-up. Again, the pelvic ring symmetry has been uh, reestablished. We've got screws in the back avoiding the sacral foramina where the nerves are, holding the back together and the front together. It looks good. Um, unfortunately, with bilateral injuries, that's a big problem because these screws, as thick as they are, are not strong enough for weight bearing. So this patient is basically wheelchair for three months, and that's hard. Uh, fortunately, it's a little bit of a younger patient, so they've got some upper, arm strength, uh, upper body strength that can help um, uh, compensate for that, but it's, it's challenging for anybody. Uh, at 12 weeks, there's no pain, and the reduction has been maintained. We advance the full weight bearing and get physical therapy going for some general gait training. Uh, uh, and uh, as actually, that was the last follow-up. The patient's going to come back and see me again in about a month at their six-month follow-up. Another type of hip fracture. So now we're getting down to really much closer to the hip joint itself. So this is a valgus-impacted femoral neck fracture. Left side, okay? 73-year-old lady, had a ground-level fall in her driveway while she's washing her trash can, okay? Comes in, pain in her left hip. I can't put weight on it. They got an x-ray here, and here's what we can see is the difference in the contour between the right and the left hip, okay? This is normal. Here, the balls just collapse back this way, okay? It is not displaced in terms of falling off. I always talk about sort of a ball of ice cream on an ice cream cone sometimes. It's sort of tipped back or sort of melting, but it hasn't completely fallen off, okay? So the kid can still lick the ice cream if you want to think of it that way. That is a fracture that's not too bad. What I mean by that is it's fairly stable. Uh, we want to uh, treat it so the patient can get up and get going as fast as possible. So. Uh, it's a low energy injury uh, from a ground level fall. It's a fragility fracture. It's a stable fracture pattern. It hasn't displaced too much. We want a minimally invasive surgery and get this patient going. So we do a percutaneous fixation. Uh, this is a fairly small surgery. Three poke holes the size of your fingertip. We put in three big screws across that fracture. That just is to hold mainly to hold. We notice we're not putting that fracture back. It's just staying put, okay? Right here. We, there are, to reduce that it would be a tr tremendous deal and probably cause more damage than worth. So we want to just keep it there so it heals where it's sitting. So these three big screws through three little incisions, five cc's of blood loss maybe, okay, takes 20 minutes. You get them up and they can be immediate weight bearing. Most of them will still have some pain, so you use an assistive device until they're feeling better. DVT prophylaxis again, physical therapy. We see them back at two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. Um, uh, this patient came back uh, at uh, six months. She's walking without an assistive device, but she's complaining of pain on the lateral side of her hip. Okay, oops, Thanks. all right. And here, you can see the screws have backed out a bit. They are designed to do that. Notice that there's threads up here and not down here. We know that bone heals best when it's squeezed together. 
So when we started fixing these hip fractures, we said, well, if we're gonna put some metal in, we want this to be able to collapse a little bit so that it will heal rather than holding them apart and maybe it doesn't heal. So they're designed to do that. And in fact, it worked, she healed. She's not having groin pain, which is what we, or deep buttock pain, which is more indicative of pain from the joint, i.e. the fracture not healing. Instead, she's got pain right out here. She's a thin lady, probably from the screws sticking out just a little bit. That's a much easier problem to treat than joint pain, a non-union or something like that. So she's continuing weight bearing, and I told her, well, call me if that really bugs you. We can think about a small surgery, either to take these screws out or change them for smaller screws. In general, for your elderly patients, I do not favor, once they've had a fracture, of just taking stuff out and leaving them unprotected. You're just waiting for another fracture and another surgery. So for these patients, I'd say, hey, we can make these smaller, but I would still put something back in to protect them. I think that makes a lot more sense than just taking it out and waiting for another fracture. Okay, and that can be done electively anytime, really. Okay, displaced femoral neck fracture. Here we are, uh, an 89-year-old lady. This, oh, this lady is great. So she lives independently at home and cares for her 91-year-old sister. She had a ground-level fall, had pain in her left hip, couldn't stand. Is in the ER saying, you gotta fix me fast, I gotta go home and take care of my sister. Uh, she's pretty awesome. So this is, this is a fracture that's kind of the most classic or typical hip fracture, okay? Uh, we have x-rays that clearly show a displaced fracture of the femoral neck. So this doesn't look like a hip anymore. The ball is stuck in the socket. The femur is displaced proximally. This is the classic shortened leg, externally rotated, pain with any passive motion of the leg in the ER, okay? The problem with this fracture is the blood supply to the femoral head is almost exclusively retrograde, okay? Meaning it's coming up the femoral neck into the ball. Uh, via the circumflex uh, femoral arteries, okay? Those are damaged or disrupted when you have this fracture. That means the healing potential of this fracture is very low. When I was a resident at the VA, we used to always reduce these and pin these, just like I showed you in that valgus impacted fracture. And it seemed to me like it was a staging procedure because six weeks later, you could come back and be sure that those screws had failed, they've collapsed again, they're very painful, and then you booked them for their hip replacement. And I just never understood it. Fortunately, in the 20 years since then, we have evolved, which is possible for orthopedic surgeons. I think we still drag our knuckles, but we do have opposing thumbs now. So um, now we just skip the, inner, the initial step and go straight to a hemiarthroplasty or a total hip arthroplasty, okay? This is a bigger surgery, admittedly, but the benefit of this is immediate weight bearing and extremely low risk of failure, okay? The difference between a total hip replacement and a, and, a, and a hemi is just whether or not we replace the socket or not, okay? Uh, we replace the socket if they've got pre-existing complaints of hip pain or hip, hip arthritis and they need a total hip replacement. Otherwise, we do a hemi, okay? Uh, a hemi in some ways is preferred. It's a little bit more stable because we don't have to remove all the socket and the capsule and the ligaments there. Uh, lower rate of dislocation with a hemi than a total, okay? Uh, so we go in there, we do these hip precautions, uh, but a lot of patients don't re will not remember them or want, will not be able to abide by them. So again, to me, a hemi, if you can do it's better because it's a lower rate of dislocation. Immediate weight bearing, uh, DVT prophylaxis for three weeks, physical therapy going, uh, and we see them back in two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months. Sometimes you have to convert them. Uh, if they do complain, again, of groin pain, or if over time you might see the space between the ball and the socket decreasing and they're getting groin pain, they may need to convert from a hemi to a total hip replacement, which is fairly routine for my colleagues who are wizards at arthroplasty. Uh, but that's the, if sometimes you wonder, you know, why do we do this versus the other? In fact, I just had uh, one of our internists ask me, why, why would they do this instead of a total? And I, and I had this exact discussion with her just two days ago. Okay, another type of hip fracture, intertrochanteric fracture. Now we're moving down the femur. You, this patient is a 95-year-old lady, uh, has got a mild touch of dementia, recently moved into an assisted living fa or a facility uh, for patients with dementia, tripped on a rug, fell down, pain in her left hip, can't bear weight. And what we see is this fracture line going from the greater trochanteric to the lesser trochanteric. Very classic looking fracture, not very displaced, okay? Um, we call this a stable fracture. It doesn't mean it doesn't need surgery in this case. What it means is that most of the supporting structures of the femur, particularly this area, what we call the calcar, where strong, thick bone is still intact. Uh-oh, man. Okay, five minutes. Um, 
Uh, and that's, so we have to fix this, but we want to make a minimally invasive surgery. We want to get it fixed quickly so that they can uh, go on and wear, bear weight. So this is, that we put in this metal rod, very strong. They can bear weight on this immediately. This goes in through two incisions, about an inch and a half each. Uh, and we get them up weight bearing, DVT prophylaxis, et cetera, okay? Three months, six months, the heels, they go about their business as quickly as possible. Pertrochanteric proximal femur fracture. This is just getting a little bit worse. Now you can see, uh, this is a 77-year-old alcoholic guy. He fell down, he had this much worse fracture. You can see the calcar area is broken now. It's a little bit more unstable. Definitely needs a surgery, obviously. Uh, but we need something a little bit stronger, so we just put a longer rod in, okay? Here's the surgery. Uh, the fracture's lined up nicely. And we continue here. Nice long rod all the way down to the knee. Uh, this patient's weight bearing at, at uh, in six weeks, he can't even remember that he had the fall. Uh, he's weight bearing with a walker. Uh, at four and a half months, he still has some discomfort, uh, he does, he, but he refuses to use the walker despite that. He's a pretty unhappy guy, uh, and he's required in home care. He's very dissatisfied, but he's ambulatory and was ambulatory immediately. Uh, I want to skip through some. I had a whole bunch of things, but I want one that's really uh, pertinent to you guys. So periprosthetic fractures, these are cool x-rays, but maybe... Uh, not as important. I think the big thing with these is you put an arthroplasty in, the bone gets really weak near the metal, and there's a big stress hazard between the metal and the bone, and we see a lot of fractures near the edge of the metal, okay? Uh, and so that creates challenges for us for fixation. They're bigger surgeries because we have to grab really weak bone, and we can't use our standard implants because the metal blocks where we'd normally put our metal. So they're challenging surgeries. The metal fixation is not quite as good, and they, have to be, they can't be full weight bearing immediately. Someday we'll get something that they can be, uh, fully weight bear on and that'll be a big difference. But what I really want to talk to you guys about in this last five minutes are atypical femur fractures, okay? This is, you guys will see these and you'll see them before they break in your clinical practice. So these are the bisphosphonate related uh, fractures. There's an incidence reported as high as 2%. There's a higher risk uh, reported in Asians and females. The relative risk after three years of use of bisphosphonate uh, are 2.1 to 128 depending on what study you look at. Presentation, the history of osteoporosis and been on bisphosphonates, a ground level fall. Many patients report feeling the, the bone give before they go down. A third to two thirds have pre-fracture symptoms, groin pain, thigh pain with weight bearing, okay? There's a whole diagnostic criteria. Uh, they have to do with these low energy injuries, uh, low grade trauma, uh, fracture patterns, which is not really pertinent to you guys, uh, and prodromal symptoms, okay? Uh, so here's a, a case uh, history. This 75-year-old guy had a history of stress fractures in his thigh in 2006, a poor historian, can't remember taking osteoporosis medications. In 2004, saw, uh, was complaining of some um, back pain and buttock pain, saw some spine surgeons, saw the physiatrist, got MRIs, eventually got a, an injection uh, that completely resolved the symptoms. Two years later, similar pains, but or, uh, new complaints of pains in his anterior thigh with weight bearing, felt different, it was atraumatic, had a slight limp, went back to the physiatrist. They did their workup again for back stuff, even did an injection, really didn't help his symptoms. Got an MRI of the thigh, which was read as resolving stress fracture, but not, no a referral was made. In June 2016, patient's walking in a parking lot, falls in a little uh, hole there, and gets a fracture, okay? Boom, this transverse fracture right here, okay? Uh, and what we see here is it's a nearly transverse, it's a low energy fracture. There's a lot of thickening of the bone here, okay? What I really want to highlight is look at this, okay? These are the changes associated with the bisphosphonate on the, on the femur, okay? These fractures are very difficult to treat once they displace, okay? They heal very slowly. We ought to put the same rod in. Uh, this is actually not that thrilled with how I reduced this here, okay? It could be a lot better. Uh, this guy had persistent pain, uh, even though we got him at weight bearing immediately. Uh, here we are at six weeks and three months, not a lot of healing. I did another pr procedure to help this heal. Again, we want bone to compress for healing, so I took out some of the screws at the bottom to, uh, of the nail to allow that, that bone to compress a little bit better. Again, slow healing. Uh, you can see how this screw, which is in the slot, is now bottomed out. That's how much it compressed. Uh, I eventually took out that screw. Uh, and finally, it goes on to heal. Okay, but it, this, this is something like 12 months later that he finally healed. Uh, this guy's pretty unhappy because he's now got hip arthritis that's proven by injection and wants to know why that's not also covered by his worker's compensation for his fracture. But the last thing I want to say about this particular guy is 
These are x-rays from 2013 and 14. He has the findings of what we call this lateral beaking. He was complaining of thigh pain then. These were taken in primary care practice, okay? And he could have had, let me just zip past all these. This is another one. Uh, this is, a, uh, that's a, analogous to this lady, who my, say the, uh, another physiatrist saw this one, came in with thigh pain. He sent this and was gonna have, have this patient come and see me in a couple weeks. I said, we called her and said, no, come in tomorrow. We talked to her about it, we got her set up. We did a prophylactic nailing. This lady was, I think this lady was 90, yeah, 91 years old. She wasn't wow. gonna let anything stop her. She spent one night in the hospital, walking this, the next day home and she's having no pain and feeling great. This is a victory. It was identified early, put the nail in, no problem, versus that other guy, 12 months to heal and still pretty unhappy and maybe never happy. Uh, that's all I have time for, I'm sorry, there was a lot more in there. Uh, I appreciate your time. I will be around for questions and stuff uh, afterwards and at lunch and so forth. Andy, um, is Dr. Klein next or you wanna? Okay. Thank you.